it's great to talk about this one. Very, very current, dependent on what setting you're in. Um, colleagues that are in the prison service, this is, this is basically the elephant in the room, really. Um, much of what you hear in the media about increases in violence, increases in suicide, loss of control in prisons, it, it, this is arguably what uh, might be the largest factor, the second largest or the largest is the staff cuts, of course. But very, very important matter. If you're not familiar with it, new psychoactive substances, this is what was formerly re referred to as legal highs. Um, out of date term now because they changed the law, so they're not legal. Okay, and even at the time they were calling them legal highs, a lot of them weren't legal <laughs> even then. Um, but just have a quick. So when they were being sold legally, uh, you could literally walk into a shop and, and buy this stuff um, over the counter. Now, what they are basically is people coming up with a synthetic way of mimicking what have been long existing, often natural products uh, that have been used as drugs of abuse. So there's basically uh, the five main classes here. Um, and what people are doing is they're taking the chemical that comes from a long-standing illicit drug and then making an artificial substance that's functionally the same as this, so it's going to have the same effect in your body, but it's one or two atoms different in the molecule. And the idea was a little while ago in Britain, still the true in, in, in quite a lot of countries, because they've changed it just a little bit from what's the illegal drug, that then made it the so-called legal high. Um, but there's still advantages to the, to the makers, even after it's now been made illegal. So the main groups, uh, probably the most common one in the UK is the cannabis um, products. So basically what they're doing is making a product which is going to mimic, in terms of its functionality, uh, the tetrahydrocannabinol that's in, in natural cannabis. Second group, ones that mimic ecstasy. Third group, ones that mimic amphetamines. Fourth group, ones that mimic LSD, uh, hallucinogen type compounds. And finally, uh, ones that mimic opiates. Um, those ones, are, I'll, I'll, I'll come a bit later on because it's not so common yet, but are arguably incredibly important in terms of the consequences that's going to have, is having in North America. Now these things, up until relatively recently, even in the UK, Basically, they were coming out with one of these products, selling it legally on shelves in head shops, as they were referring to them. This is stuff that would have been illegal if they'd have sold it as a medicine or a drug, but they're commonly labelled as not for human consumption, bath salts, plant food, all sorts of uh, names that are put on them. Basically says, don't take this, it's not for no human consumption. That means that it's not covered by any of the regulations with regard to medicines, foodstuffs, etc., etc., They've modified it one or two atoms from the naturally occurring drug, which is illegal. Therefore, they could evade the law. What was happening for a long while was the, 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 these compounds would come out, be sold. Uh, a few people would die usually, and then the government would ban them. They would then immediately change it by one or two atoms again, come out with a new compound, market that, and that's not illegal because it's not the one that just got banned. And we had a constant ongoing thing with this. Arguably that makes things even more dangerous because as fast as the police, customs, doctors, paramedics, etc. catch up on the latest drug and learn what to do with it, that drug's gone and a new one comes and nobody knows about what it is, how to detect it, how to treat it, etc. etc. So quite a dangerous uh, situation. Um, 2012, which is a little while ago now, uh, I have to get a newer figure for that, uh, 73 new ones in just one year. Okay, just to give you an idea of the diversity of this, this is from one journal article listing all of the different synthetic cannabinoids that they tested um, as part of one journal article. Okay, just to note to you, JWHO18, um, that's the name of the guy, uh, Huffman, who synthesised a lot of these things. Just if you notice there, it's, it's, he's already going as far as JWH250. To give you an idea of that one. Okay, so huge numbers of different compounds. Down the bottom there, I've just put the full name and sort of give you an idea of the complexity of some of these things. Um, but just, just be aware, a huge 
uh, the variety of these things. And as I say, as fast as any of them were made illegal, they just made a new one and sold that. And because it wasn't what was illegal, it's now legal. So they went round and round in circles with this. Probably 2007, 2008, this sort of phenomenon started coming out. Got worse and worse and worse until eventually the government did respond to this. So it's the psychoactive, this is in, in force now, so this is the current law now. Psychoactive Substances Act 2016. And what they did with this, they turned it the other way around. Up until this point, what people have been saying was, if something wasn't listed as illegal, then it was legal. And of course you then had to keep putting new things on the list, and you could never catch up. The different approach here, entirely different approach, what this one says is basically, it's illegal until they put it on a list that says it's legal, is the other way around, okay? And it's basically, anything which is a psychoactive substance, definition there, is illegal unless they've listed it as legal. So obviously common ones that are listed as legal, alcohol, tobacco, caffeine, they've added various less common ones uh, to, to those. So uh, uh, amyl nitrate poppers and things like this, they popped on the list to keep every, certain uh, people happy. And, and it's basically now a list whereby if it's not on the list, things are illegal. So it doesn't matter how many new ones they invent, if they're not, and they're not going to get put on the list, if they're not on the list, they are illegal automatically and straight away. Um, it's illegal to supply, possess with intent to supply, import or manufacture any of the, anything that falls under this. Maximum sentence of seven years. However, it's not illegal to possess for own use, okay? Except if somebody is inside a prison, then it is unlawful to possess even for own use. Um, so it's, it's, there's a differentiation there. Just to uh, make a note for you, the usual uh, case law with regard to possession with intent to supply would probably apply here. Um, it needs to be tested by case law. However, uh, in possession with intent to supply, you give me an illegal drug and I give it back to you. During the time it's in my possession, I have it with intent to supply. Yeah? I'm going to buy some drugs and we've made an agreement, you know, you give me £10, I'll take £10, we're going to share them. Possession with intent to sell. So just be aware, possession with intent to supply is perhaps a broader definition that, than, than you might expect. So that's the current <coughs> law. Let's have a look at some of these compounds. Now this is probably the main one in the UK, uh, very uh, ubiquitous now. Um, when they've investigated dr drug users, they say the average uh, person on the street actually still prefers normal cannabis, herbal cannabis, uh, the natural product. Okay, but there does seem to be in particular two communities where the artificial stuff is, is, is really the in thing. So one group is, is the homeless. Uh, there are people amongst the homeless community who are utterly addicted to this stuff and it's a, a, a real detriment uh, to them. Uh, the second group is, is prisoners uh, who have perceived all sorts of advantages from using the artificial stuff in, in preference uh, to the naturally occurring uh, cannabis, even more so when it wasn't even, you know, it wasn't actually an illegal uh, substance because people could bring it in and out without fear uh, of prosecution. Now, commonly referred to as spice and mamba, the thing you've got to say, and it's, this is also a general uh, comment really, spice and mamba, that was trade names when it was being sold legally and, and it stuck as a name amongst, you know, street community sort of thing. However, you've got to say, the likelihood of it actually being the same substances in it, uh, year after year and year, um, very unlikely to be quite honest, and the, probably the person selling it doesn't know what's in it, let alone the person buying it, uh, and is likely to change uh, over time. So which one of that, you know, that great big long list of artificial cannabinoids that, is, that I showed you is actually in any of these products, I don't know, uh, and, and probably nobody does unless it's chemically analysed. Now, there's a, the particular issues with this one. Seven times more likely um, to result in hospitalisation than normal cannabis. 30 times more likely to need emergency medical treatment. This is particularly uh, something that's uh, an issue for the paramedics. Um, the, the main one with this is tachycardia. 
Uh, so people get extremely high heart rates, uh, 180, 200 heart rate. Um, they get very poorly with it. Um, in larger doses, it also has an effect on movement. Uh, so people get this it's almost like waxy flexibility, as it used to be referred to in the old days, and, and, and can't actually get themselves up off the ground. Uh, so there's also a movement effect. Very likely to be called for uh, for the paramedics, but interestingly enough, got very short half-lives. Uh, so a lot of these things, by the time you get a paramedic there, the paramedic seeing them and taking them to A&E, it, it can actually resolve itself. There's another big problem with these ones in terms of detection. Now, most people are used to but work in uh, 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 either hospitals, prisons, whatever, are used to the smell of cannabis and would be able to detect that if their patients are using cannabis. These don't have any of those kind of odours that can be put on uh, tobacco or whatever and, and no odour other than what you would expect from the tobacco. So that's for the human staff actually sniffing it out that somebody's using the stuff. Also for the dogs, so for detection dogs, it's not cannabis, so a dog that's been trained to detect cannabis isn't going to scent it. Uh, it's as straightforward as that. Now have dogs that can, that, that can find it. Not detected by standard canna uh, cannabis tests, so if you're reliant on the usual little uh, units that Pete put a bit of urine on it and the lines come up on it, no, not going to be found by that because it's not anything like the same chemical. Uh, it's radically different. Those tests are almost certainly not going to find it. So this has implications for your urine tests. It also has uh, implications for when t uh, people are testing seized substances uh, and also in settings like uh, prisons and customs and things like that. So a lot of uh, challenges with regard to detecting the stuff. Now, what's, what's interesting about this? Well, basically, your brain has got what's called the cannabinoid system. It, in reality, it, it uses a neurotransmitter called anandamide. And what happens with this, I'll just show you. So there's a, 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 a graphic um, of a, a brain cell connecting to another brain cell. I'm just going to move across to this cameraman. Okay. So what's happening here is these are two brain cells. One's connecting to another. Message comes along this one. There's a gap here, synapse. Just be aware this gap is incredibly small. The smallest measurement most people are familiar with, millimetre on a ruler, if you imagine how small that is. A, a, a micrometer is one thousandth of a millimetre. That's smaller than a micrometer. A micrometer on this would be well, almost the width of the board, really. Yeah? So, very small gap. The message is carried from one brain cell to another by a chemical neurotransmitter. On the other side of the gap, it latches onto a receptor here, and that carries the message. What happens with the artificial, uh, with natural and artificial cannabinoids is they are chemicals so similar to those neurotransmitters that they'll carry the message. Okay, so the person is taking a chemical which is so similar to that uh, natural neurotransmitter, it will bridge that gap, lock onto the receptors carry the message. Now that's actually called did it, an agonist. Now naturally occurring cannabis carries THC, which I'll come to again in just a bit, tetrahydrocannabinol. That is a partial agonist at these receptors. So it's not quite enough like the naturally occurring receptor to have the full effect. Okay, So I mean that actually is probably quite a good thing. The difference with these synthetic ones is that these are full agonists. So they are basically sufficiently like the naturally occurring user transmitter that they have the same effect. And it's 100% of the effect that the neurotransmitter. So you're going to be talking about, for example, 100 times the effectiveness of the THC that is in natural cannabis. Okay. THC is the one that's at high levels of it in skunk cannabis, okay? And skunk cannabis is the one that's associated with high levels of mental illness, psychosis, schizophrenia, etc. So there's good research that suggests skunk cannabis has a much greater effect in terms of skunk cannabis. And then now we've got this stuff, the artificial <coughs> cannabinoids, which are a hundred times as powerful uh, as the THC in natural cannabis. Hardly surprising that this is causing you know, uh, huge effects on people's brains. 
Also, there's, a, there's, there's another feature on this one which makes it worse than uh, naturally occurring cannabis. So in naturally occurring cannabis, we've got two chemicals. Actually, there's lots and lots of chemicals, but these are the two main ones. So the two main ones, first one, THC, tetrahydrocannabinol. This is the one that gives people the high. It gives the one that gives them the buzzy type effect, the sort of slightly psychotic type effect. Um, the other one that's in naturally occurring cannabis, though, is this other one, cannabidiol, CBD is usually uh, abbreviated as. This is one that calms people down. So a lot of people that use cannabis will tell you, no, no, it doesn't make me psychotic, it calms me down, calms me down. They're not lying to you. It's just the same as when people who smoke say, smoking, car smoking takes my cough away. Well, it does, but it's also caused you cough, isn't it? They're not lying to you, okay? You know, and it's similar to that sort of thing. It is, that is true. So naturally occurring cannabis is going to have both of those effects. Skunk cannabis is high on the THC. This is why it's more powerful, why it's more likely to cause psychosis. For your information, you can also take just the CBD, put that in a spray, and that's now approved as a, a, a licensed drug for use for things like multiple cirrhosis, uh, pain relief, etc., etc., because it's not got the THC in it, it's not going to be causing psychosis, etc. It's just going to be calming people down, and that could be a positive thing, you know, under medical control. Now, the important thing about the synthetic cannabinoids, so people buying these legal highs, all it's got in it is the synthetic equivalent of the THC. So, not as it got something that's a hundred times as powerful as the THC, it hasn't got the CBD to counteract it. So you can see why it would be that comparing natural cannabis, even the high strength stuff, with these artificial things, you can see, I think, why it would be. There's, finally, just to say, you can get the artificial stuff in a little bottle as a liquid, pour it onto stuff and smoke it away. There's no real control over what dose the person is now getting, is there? Because they could have put one drop on a cigarette, or they could have squirted half a bottle on a cigarette, couldn't they? Yeah? So a, a lot of issues there that I think are pretty obvious when you see how it works. Severe uh, problems in prisons uh, with these, but as I say, particularly the artificial cannabinoids, synthetic <coughs> cannabinoids. High levels, people are smoking this stuff, high levels of psychosis, high levels of physical health emergencies. As I say, particularly the uh, tachycardia, very high heart rate resulting in loads and loads of call-outs for paramedics, people being blue-lighted. Uh, they are now responding to that by basically saying, there's so much of this that we're not going to blue-light everybody that gets a high pulse rate in jail. Healthcare staff are going to sit with them, and many of them will ride it out. Yeah, Because on the whole, it's not actually leading to death um, when they're just left. So I've had tremendous problems with that. One prison that I won't name, uh, they had a, a, a load of this brought in. Uh, everybody got put on lockup for a while as part of the normal regime of the prison. Um, this stuff had been distributed. Once they were all on lockup, they were all puffing away on it. It ended up with every blue light ambulance in the whole of a fairly big city at the prison to deal with it all because it was just suddenly all at one time they'd all got hold of this stuff they all now used it at the same time and and there was tens of them um, looking like at first sight they were going to have a heart attack or something so very very dangerous stuff leading to high levels of violence so there's a psychotic violence where people are off their head on acutely on this stuff only positive thing I can say to you on the whole, the sh short-acting effects, but it can induce a psychosis in people who are vulnerable. Um, also, um, violence in terms of uh, people who have been given the stuff, not paid for it, and there's debt. There's also uh, violence in terms of next time you go out, bring this stuff in, or when your wife comes on a visit, we want her to bring it in. If they won't go along with that, then there's violence. Increased levels of a suicide. Um, so we've got issues with drug-induced mental health problems, so the, the, the effects of the drug itself. But the other one is, uh, due to the bullying by the dealers, people are seeing suicide as the only way out of avoiding this. You know, you've got some very dangerous people, and you're not a dangerous person, and you're locked in there with them. You know, this is probably their only way of getting out of it. Also, a particularly unpleasant uh, habit that's come in being out, coming out with this one um, is the idea when a new batch comes in and the guys uh, who are the kingpins 
um, don't want to be the first one to try it because remember what I said to you nobody knows what's in it yeah so what they're doing is they're putting this in or on people's uh, somebody else's cigarettes letting them have the first go standing back and watching what happens uh, so there's people that didn't know in the first place that they were taking this stuff okay so pretty serious stuff um, as I mentioned previous some of these have very short half-lives so within 20 minutes or so it's all gone um, so you can call an ambulance to people by the time the ambulance has got there and carried them away to A&E at A&E it, it could probably have been, uh, the, the crisis is over uh, so very short also has implications for testing if you're expecting to test them a while later so effects and risks um, probably the biggest one with this one is obviously it's new stuff but you know knowledge is emerging but the main one is how can you predict what medically what this stuff is going to do if you don't actually know what's in it at least with things like the traditional drugs you know decades of experience so frankly nobody knows what's in this even the person that's selling it um, and as they change even it, well, ever evidence base that doctors have got as a new one comes out you're potentially starting from scratch again not knowing what the effects of this one is strongly recommend to you at the current time um, that it should be considered as part of mental health uh, assessment also in a, particularly in acute settings if you have a sudden deterioration in somebody's condition that this this has got to be one of the things at the forefront uh, of your mind negative drug screens um, probably good practice to be drug screening people with, 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 with psychosis but one of the things just to know with this your traditional drug screens that are looking for cannabis cocaine ecstasy etc and may or may not detect this there's every chance that you can have a negative drug screen with these that the person has taken MPS so you know um, there, there, are, uh, there are screening tests now that will test for the MPS, synthetic cannabinoids and things like that. But remember what I said to you, even when you buy those, it's a moving target. So as fast as manufacturers comes out with ones that can detect it, there could be a new one that they don't detect. But you can get screening panels that will detect it. Um, if you want an answer to the detection and classification issue, I will now show you. What usually happens is you could be using one of these drug screen panels okay and that be, might be the start and end of your process so if all you want to know is a seat of the pants assessment is this person seriously mentally or because they've got been taking something and that's the limit of it you could probably use one of those panels it comes back it's positive you know what the person's on let me say though that would be not be acceptable in a court of law okay because these things can have false positives for example I'm sure you've heard of it um, opiates so you can come back for positive on opiates because you've eaten poppy seed bagels and things like this yeah so it wouldn't be acceptable to a criminal court for sure I've actually seen it where it's being turned that evidence has been turned down by mental health tribunals uh, for restriction order cases because this is seen as a quasi judicial thing uh, you keep in the person in custody uh, deprived of their liberty for another 12 months until they get another tribunal they're imposing higher standards of evidence so what will happen is if you want a, a better level of testing you send it to the lab okay let me say to you the first thing the lab will probably do will be to run one of those yeah uh, that then don't commonly mention it but basically the next stage is a lot more expensive so if it's negative they're not going to do the more extensive stage yeah so up until recently unless you ask that would come back negative they wouldn't run the next stage okay so it could still come back negative and the person has used MPS what you really need to detect this is let's basically forget about this first stage let's just use the machine that goes ping okay this is called a gas chromatograph mass spectrometer basically what it is it's a pipe with a substance in it you put your sample in at one end and it steadily makes its way through the pipe okay eventually it comes out of the end and it's detected by the mass spectrometer bit classifies what the compound is that's gone through it by how long it took it to get through the column the, the bigger and heavier the molecule the longer it takes so what it's basically doing when it does a graph like this it's telling you how long the substance took to get through the machine okay that will find it okay that will find literally nanogram quantities uh, of substance 
and it will always find it. The only question will be is whether, if it's something completely new, whether they'll be able to put a label on the top of it, or will they just be able to say, say to you, well, it's something new, okay? But if it is an existing one, the people who are skilled in this, National Poison Centre in Birmingham can do this, and they will basically be able to give you this sort of information. They will tell you what's in it, um, whether it's negative on those type of screens or not. So very helpful uh, technology there, but just what I'm saying to you is be cautious if you place too much relier on the immunoassay uh, panels, because they may or may not detect uh, uh, MPS. Everybody got that idea of that one, yeah? Now, some of the other ones that I just want to mention to you briefly, as I say, the synthetic cannabinoids are by far and away the m most commonly used in the UK. Um, on the streets, as I say, with homeless communities, in the prisons, I'm sure it's going to be encountered by you in, in a variety of other environments. So quantity-wise, definitely the most important one. The other ones, a couple of us I just want to add in, not so much because of the quantity of use in the UK, but because of the potential risks. This one, in terms of potential risks, is, is, is massive. I will say to you, in the UK, we've got now had the first few deaths from this. North America, this is enormous. If you talk to people who are medical examiners and pathologists and that at conferences from America, they are t they're talking about this as an epidemic. Uh, this is killing hundreds of people, not in the, nationally, but in one city. Okay, it's, it's that major to them. So basically what you've got is, these are... The MPS, so the synthetic chemicals that are intended to mimic opiates, like opium, morphine, heroin, yeah, codeine, etc., etc., etc. So they might be sold as an MPS, and the end user is actually being told what it is they're taking, and that's what they want. Okay, and they're happy with that. It can also be sold as what uh, probably one of the biggest risks that we've had so far in the UK is that this is sold to people as heroin and what has happened is as I'm sure you know heroin bought on the street has relatively small amounts of heroin in it and then the rest of it is probably going to be dextrose or something like that yeah what they're doing is the low levels of the active ingredient are sort of being reinforced by adding the MPS so there's a certain amount of heroin in it, or none, and then they're adding the artificial stuff to provide the, positive, the actual uh, active effect that the drug user is after. Okay? So one of the things that's uh, potentially risky with this one is people are buying this stuff as their normal heroin. The practical experience of it may, might be, it might only be 10% or 5% or something actual heroin in there normally. But the dealers have added this stuff because the heroin was more expensive than this. Yeah? Particularly at times you know, where there's troubles in Afghanistan and that and they can't get the material. So they're putting this stuff in there. Now where this is different, you can't overstate just how much more potent this stuff is. So the normal stuff, as you can see down there, a lot of these fentanyl, and you can see a lot of them down there, car fentanyl, alpha methyl fentanyl. You know, I said it's just one or two atoms different, yeah? And fentanyl is, is a legitimate medical drug. It's, a, it's an opiate painkiller. They, at times when they've had difficulty getting sufficient amounts of opium to make heroin and morphine and things like this, they, they've made it as an artificial. And this is where it comes from originally. Fentanyl, compared with morphine sulfate, is 100 times more powerful than morphine sulfate. Okay, 100 times. Okay, the most powerful one, sorry, moving about again, this one here, carfentanil, that is 10,000 times as powerful as morphine sulfate. Just to give you an idea of that, the doses for sedating, the only thing it's legit, you can't use it for people. It's the only legitimate usage for it. You know when you watch uh, safari and vet programs and they shoot the dart at the bum of a rhinoceros and about th three or four minutes later the rhinoceros would bump like this, doesn't it? That's carfentanil. Yeah? The dose for uh, an animal of that size is one or two mils. Three, five, six, something like that milligrams. 
to completely sedate a rhinoceros, well over a ton, yeah? To give you an idea of how dangerous this is to a human, a vet was preparing a dose of that. In the actual dose, there was 1.2 milligrams in the whole of the dose. While the vet was doing it, he sort of snapped it like that, a drop hit him in the eye. Five minutes later, he was unconscious. Another couple of minutes after that, he wasn't breathing at all. The only thing that saved his life was colleagues doing artificial respiration with him, and then eventually they gave him the, the antidote to it. Vets will not use it. They first draw up the antidote, then they draw up the carfentanil. Okay, that's just to give you an idea. People are pouring this stuff into bags of white dextrose powder to make what the addicts then think is their normal supply. I don't think it takes any much thought at all to realise you could end up with something this strong or something this strong, couldn't you? And the addicts and heroin is normally this strong. You know, and they think they're taking the same. They're taking uh, 10 times, 100 times the, the, the dose that they're used to. So very, very, very dangerous. The risk, of the risk of death from it is respiratory suppression, just like any opiates. The person will fall unconscious, their breathing becomes slower and slower. Once it goes below 10 breaths per minute, you need to be start being a bit worried about people. Eventually it slows down and stops altogether. Respiratory centre of their brain has been suppressed, they can't breathe for themselves. Other than that, they're perfectly healthy. If you breathe for them, expired air, artificial respiration, bag and mask, etc., you will happily keep them alive. They don't need the cardiac compressions unless they've you know, been gone for too long. The answer to it um, is, is basically there's an antidote called naloxone, right, or naltrexone, but it's commonly naloxone uh, that's on issue. You can get that and just inject people. There's also autojects, uh, you know, like people have for the EpiPens, and you just bash that onto people's legs, including through the trouser leg. Um, there's also sprays of it that you can spray into people's mouths. In the US and Canada now, it's now becoming pretty standard. Um, uh, paramedics, fire brigade and police officers are just carrying this stuff with them. Um, so if you have somebody that you find, uh, the common one would be, and this has happened in UK hospital, me uh, mental health hospitals, patient lost, found them in the toilet with the door shut, they're un unconscious on the floor and their breathing has virtually stopped. I think you've got to think about this, yeah? So this is very dangerous. This is literally hundreds of deaths in one city in the US. Um, and everybody that you speak to, medical examiners, coroners, uh, etc., pathologists that you talk to from America, this, this is their big thing. Yeah. So that's synthetic opiates. The other one I'll just mention, synthetic cathinones. Now, cathinones are the stimulant that's in CAT the one that's particularly used in East Africa, Somalia, etc., etc. So it's like a, uh, a like a sort of like almost like celery sort of stick thing that the ch people chew away on, and it's got a substance in it which is similar to amphetamines. Okay, so it's an upper. So that's cathinones is the naturally occurring substance that's in that. This is called synthetic cathinones. Um, things like one of the common ones is meow meow uh, uh, yeah, that they use. Um, but these ones, the synthetic ones, again, because it's synthesised chemically, it's, it's much more potent. Risks of this one, psychosis, including the excited delirium, where people are acutely psychotic and, and very difficult to, to manage behaviour and restrain, etc. Also increased risk of death, because it will in, in and of itself cause heart arrhythmias. Combined with the stresses of being restrained, it's a significant risk increasing factor. Uh, there's a case I've just been involved in recently where a guy believed that he was smoking uh, a, a cannabis cigarette, and in fact, somebody had spiked it with this stuff. Um, he was then psychotic for the next four or five hours and, and ended up dying uh, after contact with the police. Um, so just be aware of, the, the, of this one as well in, in terms of those risks. Yeah. How how is the time? Um, just a couple more minutes. Yeah, yeah. I'll just mention this one to you. Prescribed drugs. Um, some of you may be familiar with this one, modafinil. Um, if you work with uh, ADHD, yeah. So it's a sim. It's a, 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 a an alertness increasing drug. It's used. Um, it's it's used in ADHD. The other one you can use it for is jet lag. 
uh, uh, US Air Force pilots, and apparently Barack Obama uh, have used this. Like, you know, when they fly in Air Force One and then they land in Russia and they have to do trade talks and this. Well, the Russian president's, you know, on his normal routine, isn't he? The American president's flown in and has got jet lag. So you give him this stuff and it can keep you awake with uh, enhanced, with normal levels of alertness and psychological functioning for up to 40 hours. Okay. Um, now what's happening with this one is, obviously medically prescribed, shouldn't be too much of a What's happening with this is basically that students are using it. Um, and they're using it to, well, if it makes your brain work better, sounds great for when I'm doing my next exam. Yeah. Also the night before the exam, you can stay up three or four days running. And, and you know, get, uh, keep, keep yourself going on this. Um, study for 20 hours of the day when your non drug enhanced colleagues can only study for five or six hours. Yeah, unsurprisingly, um, people see this as a side effect, which I'm, I'm not sure. You know, it's supposed to keep you awake, and they see the insomnia as a side effect. Uh, go figure. Okay, when if it makes you high when you're on it, when you come off it, it makes you low. So, effects of depression. But while people are on it, it's an upper, so surprise, surprise, it causes psychosis as well. So if you've got people who are students, uh, etc., watch out for this one because this again is decreasing in popularity. Oh yeah, sorry, I, was, I wasn't going to do this one, but we've got a moment just for me. Okay, so other dumb ideas. This is basically putting a direct current electrical stimulation straight through your brain. Okay, and this young lady here, to be fair, is, is a neurobiologist at Oxford <laughs> University. She knows what she's doing, yeah? Other people are buying kits off the internet, yeah? Wiring their brains up with this. It does literally put a direct current through your brain. Lowers the action potential of brain cells, makes your brain cells more active. Same idea as the modafinil, yeah? You've got to study for an exam. Most people can only manage it, you know, for eight or ten hours. Why yourself up like this? You extend your attention span. Uh, the issue with it is, she says she wouldn't do it. You shouldn't do it for more than about twenty minutes. Uh, these people are just sticking it on and keeping themselves going throughout the night, and basically they're frying their brains. Yeah, because first off, they're not using it correctly. Also, the kit that you bought off eBay or something, you know, um, may or may not be giving the right current and waveform. And again, you know, again, who would have thought uh, something you bought off the internet and used to put an electric current through your brain? Not a great idea. So there's another one for you: new and emerging ways of frying your brain. Okay. So there you go. Oh, so, so there's loads of this. Okay, that, that'll do it. We'll be at it all day. We. So okay, and do you want me to do questions now? Or? Yeah, any questions? Any questions? Uh, it's, uh, we're all pretty, pretty dumbstruck by that, but uh, uh, anyway, we'll give you the website. If you don't ask questions, I'm going to wire your brain up. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask, the antidote drug, mm -hmm. if that person is not actually um, suffering from the NPS, if you give them the antidote, is there any problem no, with that? No, it's, it's, it's basically harmless. Yeah, Thank you. Um, it's, you're relatively, you're very unlikely to do harm by uh, a false positive, and if it's a false negative where you assume they're not <coughs> having that syndrome and you don't give it, it would kill them. So the argument they took, this is the argument with regard to giving it to say policemen. They're not medically qualified, but basically if they give it to the wrong, if somebody who's not got this syndrome, it doesn't do any harm. If the person had got this syndrome and they don't give it, the person's going to die. So it's you know it's a no-brainer give it even to people who aren't medically qualified, basically. Yeah. Will it give benefits to people who have taken ordinary Yes, it is. It's exactly. Yes, yes, absolutely, exactly, exactly the same uh, thing. Yeah. So another one. Yeah. So sorry. Um, I just went, really wanted to ask is because of the late night entertainment industry, obviously that's quite an important factor. And at the end of the day, is this something that could be developed in terms of part of the training program for? those people involved in that environment mm -hmm. to be able to give that medication to somebody yes. who's not qualified to do so. Yeah, absolutely. Um, because obviously there's this element whereby <laughs> administering medication to people if you're not qualified, there's always that, that, that big thing. But for most security member, uh, staff, then this could be something most likely for first my, my, my belief is if you got to the same <coughs> sort of situation as they've got, it's North America, Canada I think is the worst for, for this particular thing, sure. um, uh, then USA is more prescription opiates. Uh, Canada more the, end of the, the fentanyl. Uh, my belief is that if you got to that sort of levels where there was 
tens or hundreds of cases in one city, uh, you're going to cross the threshold as they have in some American areas where people are just going to say it's a no-brainer to, to give it to an ever-increasing number of homeless shelters, d drug sure. centres, you know, you know, you, you're going to give it to all sorts of people uh, to have this available uh, to them. Um, it, it's not that difficult. To, the person is unconscious and their breathing slows and slows and slows until it stops. I mean, your normal breathing rate, 15 uh, breaths per minute, something like this, it's going down below 10, it's going down... Four, if you ever see this sort of thing, um, four breaths per minute is, you know, it's very obvious yeah. that there's something wrong. You know, you're down to the levels of breathing of the crocodile or something. Um, it's, it's not natural. So my, my belief would be if it gets to the levels they've got in North America, uh, I would think you'd see a very wide uh, okay. rollout of the naloxone. Sorry, um, the current first aid laws are that you are not allowed to have anything in your first aid kits to uh, yeah, administer absolutely. to anybody. Is there, yeah. Do you know if there's any plans to change that? No, I, I, I think it would be if it gets to the levels it is in, in the US. It's, it's risk to benefit ratio, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so I agree with you at the moment, it would be unlawful. It's a prescription medicine. Yeah. Uh, it's POM uh, class. Um, yeah, but it's on a prescription. Um, so at the moment, you definitely couldn't. But, it, you know, I mean, I just, I, I, to me, it's a no brainer that, that if you were getting, um, if you were getting deaths virtually every day in a city, in one city, then I think you know you would change that quite rapidly, uh, and, and they have in the US. Okay. Fantastic. Uh, that's great. Thanks very much, John.